Amen. Well, praise God. We're going to go ahead and get started on chapter 9. Praise God. You want me to get started on this one? Praise God. All right, let's go ahead with the first foundation scripture here. Um, So obviously the title says it all, and we're going to go ahead and scan through it. And um, as we chop and change between Pastor April and I, uh, you know, we will, um, you know, browse through it as fast as possible and watch the time and then accelerate as we need. So praise God. By the grace of God so far, we've kept everything at least under one hour for two sessions every single week. So that's been a blessing. We want to be consistent with that at all times. Praise God. So the first scripture there, if you're reading from a PDF, um, just know you're on chapter nine. We're starting with the first verse on that course. If you have the manual, it's on page 73. So all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So I want you to see one of the key words here, obviously, as we're dealing with the work of follow-up. In other words, hey, you know, uh, once now that you're saved, what next? The follow-up is now that you're saved, what next? Well, in that verse of Scripture in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All right. So there's the discipling part that is very, very important. Um, I want to just kind of make a few points here. Um, And that is this, that, you know, uh, in a lot of places and we don't look, here's what I'm going to go ahead and tell you. We're not going to criticize how people do their evangelism. Reinhard Bonnke was very famous for mass crusades. Um, there's other forms of ministry that are one-on-one. There's where the masses are being one. Um, and all of those, because we can never ever determine where the heart of a human being is. And so the gospel works, whether it's to one or whether it's to the multitudes. The point that I'm trying to get at here is the aftermath. And I know Reinhard spent a great deal as much as he could, but when you've got a million people coming to your meetings, he had attendances of over a million Um, In fact, one of his attendances was so large, they received a million salvation forms. In other words, a million people actually responded to the altar call in one single meeting. And uh, anyway, I digress because I could go on and on about that story. The point of the matter is he did his very best to do what we call follow-up. Sometimes it's very difficult to do it. So uh, the reason why we do agree with the follow-up is this is because, you know, it's the equivalent of a mother giving birth to a child and the child coming out into the world and then not knowing how to fend for itself. And that child becomes what we call an orphan. Uh, And so we don't want to bring people to Jesus and leave them as orphans uh, to the best of our ability. And thank God, even in the middle of all of that, that the Holy Spirit is involved in that life of that believer. If that person was left as an orphan and they experienced a salvation so powerful that the Holy Spirit in them quickened them uh, to grow in their walk with the Lord, to find a place where they can be rooted and planted and grow in the things of God. Um, Now let's move to the next paragraph and then I'm going to probably go a little bit faster because I added quite a bit of information here already. Both phrases, make disciples and teaching them, imply an ongoing process. So, you know, we can lead somebody to Jesus, but to disciple and to teach them is an ongoing process. Uh, Remember this, and then I'm going to jump forward. Just remember this, as we're doing these notes and we're speaking out of the overflow, this is why it's important to have the manual, because you can still continue to read over this, um, and we can accelerate through it and just go to the third or the fourth paragraph. Sometimes we'll just say, let's go to the next page. But the important part about that is, is that out of the overflow, you're getting extra information, which coincide and work well with what you're reading right here on these pages. So thank you for your patience uh, uh, in, in hearing all of this. So well, no, uh, I will say go ahead. You, yeah, um, go ahead. Just realize, too, there are assignments in the back for you to fill out. Right. 
We're not grading these. You don't have to turn them in, but that's for your own use. Um, just to review what you've learned. So if we may have missed, I don't think we'll miss anything, but we're not reading directly to you every time. Like right. you said, we're going in the overflow. And if we've missed, you know, something, then you're going to find that in your review questions and see what, you know, what else you need to look up. So absolutely and um, I, I don't want to make this a part of the lesson but needless to say we will be furnishing you uh, with the information for healing school and evangelism and, and evangelism one both you'll have all of the information you need uh, for the back of the manual there so we want you to be able to fill in as much as possible and then cross-reference the um, the answers that we will furnish you with after the fact. So praise God. So uh, let's continue. Teaching them uh, implies an ongoing process. So we've got to bring the saints of God to maturity. We've got to, it's not a one-time deal. It's an on, it's an ongoing deal. And my point that I was about to make in extra information here is that when you got saved, and I've said this so many times on Sunday mornings, for those, for those of you that have heard it, I know that I would have said it at least once for everybody in this call, but I usually like to say this, when you got saved, and let's say you came to Destiny Church on a Sunday morning, you got saved. When you walked out of the building, guess what? You got saved. You became a new creation in Christ, but you still took your head with you out of the door. Discipleship is going to be the renewing of your mind to the reality of what that salvation purchased for you, what Jesus purchased for you on the inside of you to produce and mature you into the man or woman of God that God's called you to be. So I'm going to carry on here with one more paragraph, and then um, I'm going to hand over to my wife here to, to what a disciple is, and then we'll accelerate a little bit forward. So in this lesson, we will discuss the need for follow-up after a person's initial decision to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, as well as consider the goal of of all follow-up work. So I'll just leave it at that right now. You can jump on in here, love. So he kind of already said this. What is a disciple? If you look down, it says a learner, a pupil, one who becomes taught. So these terms describe what it is to be a disciple in the broadest sense. Now let's put forth the criterions Jesus set forth as a test of true discipleship. An all-surpassing love for the person of Christ, submission of the lordship of Jesus Christ, obedience to the commands of Christ. Can you see the difference? So being a disciple goes far beyond the just that initial general decision making. We want people to grow in their walk with the Lord. And that's what a disciple it is, is helping train people in the way that they should go. That's why even when, when we talk about disciplining our children, it's really disciple. It's teaching them in the way um, that they should go, whether as scripture or maybe they're called to be at a... Um, you know, work with wood so that we teach them in carpentry, but it's discipling. It's it's apprenticeship. Um, from king to crucifix, throughout three years of Jesus' ministry on earth, we see that he brought definition to the understanding of what it meant to be a disciple. Uh, we can just see that by his general walk with the 12 disciples, um, spending time with them. I'm sure, you know, he taught them many parables and many truths along the way. He's, he ate with them. He dined with them. Now, do you have to live and, and travel the world with the people that you win to Christ? No, certainly not. But our example of Christ and how he um, took people into his life to look after them, it, he had 12. Do we need to have 12? No, not necessarily. But I like to remind people, just start with one person. You know, not everybody that you win to the Lord, you might not ever see them again. But if somebody that you see on a regular basis, you know, we've got tools such as Jen Goodman's bookmark. Um, I gave her today some tags with uh, has our church name on it. Um, I'm going to print off some more, and she's going to cut them in groups of 10 so you can just place that sticker. It's got our church name, address, and times on it. So that's one way. Um, to encourage people, hey, we've got great things happening at Destiny. If you want to experience the presence of God even more, here's this bookmark. Here's what you do. Here's the address to our church. So that's one way, you know, inviting them to church. You, um, it says those who are at the top of page 74 after um, from King to Crucifixion. There were two, there were those who were curious and willing to be taught by Jesus yet made no commitment to what he taught. Multitudes found there was something new and afresh, something unique in Christ's teachings. They came to be challenged and stimulated intellectually, yet they were unwilling to make the personal commitment to the truth that was being spoken to the person or the teacher. They also sought him because they ate of the loaves and were filled. 
So some people just went for Jesus just for what he could do for them. Not all seed bears fruit. You know, the parable of the sower, we talk about that, what kind of ground it falls on. So there's the reality that not every seed that we plant will bear fruit. The fact that you were obedient, obedient is better than your sacrifice. So you may have experienced some of that. And and sometimes, you know, it might take some watering, watering, like Pastor Sharon gave a testimony of she had passed a track out. Uh, I'm not sure how long before that, uh, but when she went to a checkout counter, I believe it was, and ministered to the lady there, the lady actually said, yeah, you gave me something um, a long time before. So Pastor Sharon actually planted a seed and watered it unrealized, but it ministered to the lady that the love of God was so strong to reach out to her, not once, but twice and by the same person. And so that would have been good ground. That's good soil that that received that seed of the word of God. As soul winners, our heart's desire should be that every convert becomes a true disciple of Jesus Christ. We must acknowledge the fact that there have been many individuals who prayed the prayer to accept Christ, yet they never went on to really walk with God and get to know him. What we do want to recognize is the work of follow-up will play an important role in determining what kind of Christian a person becomes. You know, uh, when Pastor Melissa and Stephanie Daniels and they then Jen Schmidt, all the ones that are running with the crusade on November 2nd, that's why churches are there that they can connect with, whether it's our church or any other church that's joined forces with us in Lafayette, they have a place that they can attend to, to learn, to grow, to be discipled. Correct. Um, growing up, a convert is a team effort. And he, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, that scripture we could spend probably 30 minutes on in itself, but how many of you would agree, and you can give me a thumbs up or not, we are not in the unity of faith yet, not even close. We are not experiencing all the fullness of Christ that we should. So, thus saying, all those scriptures prior to that, we need the fivefold ministry. It didn't end in the New Testament. We need the fivefold ministry and the fivefold, all in of fact, those. In fact, I want to say this. It, it not only didn't end, it began in the New Testament. Right, exactly. So. And, and fivefold is the prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and apostles. We equip you to do the work of the ministry. So that doesn't mean that the those fivefold uh, ministries do all the work. To the contrary, we equip you to do the work of the ministry. And what does that look like? It looks like discipleship, leading people down the road, down the right path into the Word of God, using bookmarks again, like what Jen said, this is how you read your Bible, helping them navigate scriptures and things in life. Because the fact of the matter is, is you can become a believer, but you still have a renewing of the mind process to go through. You have old ways of thinking, you have old ways of doing things that can still crop up that are contrary to God's word. And as a believer, you're the one that's to equip them and help them navigate to the truths of God's word that are that their mind and their old belief systems are contrary to. Um, at the top of the page, this is one of the ways of discipling, page 75 um, in the manual. I'm not sure of the PDF. It just depends on what platform or phone you're using, but mentoring. Take a look at your own life. Without much effort, you could probably name five people that have been very influential in your Christian walk. We can think of mentoring relationships of the Bible, such as Elijah and Elisha, Moses and Joshua, Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Timothy. Right. We never stop needing each other. And I can guarantee you, no matter who is the disciple and who is the mentor, God will see to it that both individuals grow through the relationship. Jesus himself showed us how to make disciples during his three years of ministry on earth. So he mentored all of those 12 disciples. He poured into them. He spoke into their lives. He spoke truth and he loved them. You know, And that's the example that we should show as believers. And feel free to pop in anytime you have any You've got. He's got no, lots no. of. Hot, he's I like. Gonna, I was gonna say. Um, I was gonna say. Yeah, this mic boom arm thingy here. He's very highlight happy, and so it's a bit intimidating. So I don't want to like. Don't. He, I'm not even gonna show mine. That he's like the highlight king. All so right. I'm gonna let him speak a little bit because he's really highlighted <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I highlight a lot. I just highlight some of the things that I may or may not mention. Um, you know, I just wanted to say back to the point of growing up. Uh, growing up, a convert is a team effort. Um, that's also fits hand in hand with the glove, with mentorship and, and mentoring, just like, you know, many of you 
um, can say there's a lot of people, you can name at least five people that you've sat down under or listened. When I say sat under, you've listened, you've exposed yourself, you've listened to what they have to say, and, and you felt spiritually fed by what they had to share. Um, but anyway, you know, you look at Paul, um, and I use him as an example, Paul um, uh, Smoke, that's in here with us tonight. Welcome, Paul. Love you. Um, you know, he came in and truly we can testify to the fact that out of the obedience of uh, E.C. and Sarah leading him to the Lord and the Holy Spirit leading him to them. Uh, but then, you know, they poured into him. I mean, they were pouring into him literally uh, on an ongoing basis. And then Paul started to develop relationships and he's still connected with E.C. and Sarah and he's built brand new relationships. But it became a body uh, mentoring. I mean, we all poured into him the ministry of the word from the pulpit uh, through through the people that we brought you, including myself and the leaders here have poured into him. And now it's been such a blessing that Paul is automatically, you know, there's something to this. When, when, when you grow up under or uh, in something and you're being poured into, there's something about you will repeat what you've learned. And so automatically Paul now, as he's being discipled, automatically becomes somebody who disciples. Why? Because he's going to do exactly what was done to him, which is absolutely amazing. And that's part of the mentoring process. You know, of course, mentorship in this particular part of the uh, manual has got to do with uh, being poured into by somebody that you can receive from um, that is helping to produce in you. Uh, the uh, the call, the gifts and the talents that God has placed on the inside of you. I just want to quickly read the scripture from Psalms 141 verse 5 in the mentoring uh, section, probably about one, two, three uh, paragraphs down. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness and let him rebuke me. It shall be as ex uh, as as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse refuse it. Jesus Himself showed us how to make disciples during His three years of ministry on earth. He made an investment of His time and energy. Making disciples seldom happens accidentally. It is not always convenient, and some individuals require more intention. How many of you realize that? Some people just get it faster than others, and. Um, and sometimes it just boils down to sometimes we just don't want to let go of certain things. But still, nevertheless, the process still continues. We've got to walk in the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God and continue. Our job, remember, in the discipleship process is to love people, speak the truth in love and let the Holy Spirit do the work and love them through the process. Amen. I just wanted to add tag on to that, even though it's not highlighted for me. Um, your words are highlighted to me, and it spoke to me. It spoke oh, volumes. Oh, bless you. So I just wanted She's to say— She's so sweet, guys. I just wanted to say <laughs> that, you know, even when your frustration, you might have told somebody something, and they're still dealing with the same problem, and you feel like, didn't they not hear me the last time? That's when you really need a Holy Ghost minute to, to allow the Holy Ghost to do the work in that person, like he said. It's so important because— then you're doing it out of frustration. If you're like, gosh, it's it's almost like having a child sometimes. You know, you have to repeat yourself over and over again, but not necessarily. You don't always have to necessarily do that. There, if you're getting to the point of frustration with somebody, take a step back, just love on them, and let the Holy Spirit have his way until you feel a release to minister something else again. And obviously, we're talking about situations where people are having a hard time overcoming things or understanding things or dealing with the same issues all the time. Um, you know, let God do his work because through that love process, you know, sometimes some of the greatest mentoring comes in you listening to a person. The Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. And we've had countless testimonies of when, and some of the, some of our greatest, um, full of wisdom, pastoral people, where they'll say, I've sat with somebody for two hours and I said five minutes of words, left the conversation and they were like, wow, that was amazing. Thank you for your time. You have so much wisdom. They spoke five minutes out of that 120 minutes. And so it just goes to show you sometimes it's not about how much I have to say. It's what the Holy Spirit wants to lead and guide you in. And sometimes he might tell you, don't say a word. Just listen. Don't say that. Just wait. Just love on them. Just go for coffee. Go buy them dinner. Go clean their house. 
Sometimes it is that. And so you have to discern as a believer being led. The Bible says that he leads us beside still waters. The Bible says he makes a crooked place straight. You have to discern when and when not to intervene in a situation. I kind of went off on a tangent there, but that's what stood out to me. Um, you know, and um, there was something else you said that triggered something that I wanted to say. Well, I didn't mean to trigger you. Well, in a good way. It was a good trigger. <laughs> um, <laughs> Praise God. I well, if you say, can't remember... Oh, it, I do remember. It came to me now. Okay. Um, I just have to retrace my thoughts. It's okay. Well, I'm glad I helped you, you in the process. Yes, thank you. Um, so the other thing about mentoring that each of us needs to realize, we should always try to, to when we're building people up, it should never be like, well, you know, what if they super, super pass me? What if they surpass me and they become greater? That it should actually be your goal. Amen. To, you want to train somebody up to succeed above you. That should be always be our goal. Looking to um, basically work yourself out of a job or work yourself out of a situation. You want to see that person grow so much that they're, it's, it's, they're off the milk. You've weaned them. And then they're finding someone else. So our goal should always be to create a disciple and someone in such a way that it's you have a relationship with that person, but it's like a baby that's weaned. You know, there comes a time when they no longer really need that milk and they can go on to the solid and greater things. So keep that in mind. You know, um, if your security and your identity is in being that leader or being that mentor or having that title, then you really don't know your identity in Christ because our identity isn't pastor, apostle, whichever title, prophet, sometimes he's a prophet, evangelist. Our title is a son and child of the Most High God. We function in those offices, absolutely, but my identity should not be rooted in those things. My identity is in the foundation of Jesus Christ and who I am in him. When I flow out of that, then those things shouldn't even matter. I should want somebody to surpass me in whatever I do. Hope Amen. That makes sense. Well, we'll move on to the next page, but under the no excuses section, it's simply circular reasoning there. If you read in that last paragraph, make sure you don't excuse yourself uh, from witnessing because of circular reasoning, such as, well, I know discipleship and mentoring takes a long time. I don't have the time to be able to witness and disciple and mentor. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. So um, don't allow yourself to have reasoning like that. Now, I will say this. Of course, um, trust me, we, we can be the best at whatever. We still have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Um, and and uh, you'll see many people uh, can go on without even having anybody to, to mentor them and disciple them. But it wasn't because of anything other than the goodness of God towards them. But it still doesn't mean that we shouldn't disciple and pour into people there. So, um, you know, it's easy, it's easy to, to, to become lethargic, you know, and it does. Let's be honest. You know, sometimes there's a price to pay. You know, you, you sometimes, and the, the, the biggest deal is, number one, I don't have the time. And then number two, uh, I don't have the time becomes the excuse because I don't really feel. You know that word feel? I don't really feel like it. And so that's where we've got to, as born again Christians, choose to love our brother above ourselves or our sister above ourselves and say, you know, and, and what I found that when you go and do it besides what you feel and you sit and you fellowship with somebody and, you, and you're there with them, when you're done with meeting with them, there's such a satisfaction that comes. And then you're going, man, I'm so glad that I did it. Uh, your flesh just didn't want to do it. It had nothing to do whether you like the person or not. Um, and sometimes the Lord will put you in situations where the person you're dealing with might not necessarily be, you know, your... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, your um, when you when you click with somebody, uh, you're exact. It might be the polar opposite of 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 you in personality, um, but that's more about God doing something in you while you're discipling them. So God's teaching you something while you're doing this. God uses every opportunity to work in the hearts, in our hearts, and in everybody that we're dealing with. He's so amazing. Well, God and is good. on the bottom of that page, we will have in the mix at some point like a new believers course. Yes. We may even ask some of you to teach it. It might be on a Sunday night. 
um, once a month. You know, exactly. That, that's something that's in the mix. We have material that we can use for new converts, for new believers, because they're coming in. As you guys get stirred up, and that's really that's really the heart of, of Jesus. He wants to win the lost, and so we want to operate just as he does and reach the lost. And when we do that, um, and you can bring them to that new convert class, we'll let you know. that That'll be in the near future, um, that class. Amen. But that's just another opportunity to help disciple them. In and, the, in the bit, and then I was going to say, uh, you know, before we move on here and then we're going to accelerate here because, you know, we'll just kind of just go through this very, very quickly um, before we get into the next lesson. Uh, not that we're, we're not that we're trying to rush it. But one of the things is, is that with the no excuses and don't use that circular reasoning is at the very least, like it says in the paragraph there, at the very least, you know, if you're unable to have the time to disciple them, then, you know, we live in America, you know, in foreign nations. Uh, it's something like three or four people to one vehicle. In America, it's like 1.2. Like the statistic is like 1.2 people per vehicle. Everybody has a car on average. So, you know, you can, in Africa, even though it's four people to a vehicle, they'll put eight people in a vehicle. Bless God. I mean, they will, they will make a way to load the vehicle up and they will go pick up people to bring them to fellowship, to get to church, to be discipled, to be matured. So bring them to church. The chances are you won't even have to pick them up because they've got a car. But, you know, I hate to say this. This is, please, uh, the context is not what I'm trying to say here. Um, you know, in the business world, they say the money is in the follow-up. The money's in the follow-up. In, in all, especially in the sales industry, you introduce somebody to a product, they're excited in the heat of the moment, and they say, well, let me go speak to my wife about it or whatever. They leave, and then the, the longer the time period is from the time that they leave until the next time that you communicate, the space in between your next communication, they are they are, if they were 100, if they were 350 degrees or whatever, 425 degrees, like that's the perfect temperature, I believe, to put a frozen pizza in the oven. If they were 425 degrees when they walked away from you because they were on fire, they just wanted to, they really wanted to, to purchase what you had, then every moment, every hour, they're going down a couple of degrees until they co get cold feet. And so, um, you know, let's, let's invite them, be a professional in invite her, get them into the church. If you don't know how to do it and whatever, you know, a God, God, it still counts that you can have enough influence over somebody's life to bring them to the church and then let the minister or, or the leaders or, or anybody minister to that person, bring them to the Lord. It still counts as your heavenly reward just for, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Are you with me? Praise God. All so right. So we have new believers can survive without a follow-up. That is, like he said, that should be the exception. So I'm going to leave that at that. That's, there are some scriptures that talk about the possibility of that. We'd rather that be the exception, not the rule. Well, there's just one. There's a couple of scriptures yeah. like un, uh, uh, Philip and the well, eunuch. That's what I'm saying. So, so there's a there is. You know, that doesn't mean now that we've got we don't make Bible doesn't doctrine make out us, of one scripture. Doesn't make the you excuse. know it's there, it's there. So praise God. And then we have immediate and short term follow up. Sometimes following a first time visitor to the church can be the very event that leads the person's salvation. Okay, so inviting them to church, inviting them to events like um, the outreach we have. All of those things can be a form of follow-up, you know, whether we have a worship night or anything like that. Just getting them in the presence of God. Some guidelines. If Now, we have um, Brother Dale and Miss Sandra, they do a lot of home visits. So if you are, um, these are just some guidelines if you are visiting a home. It says visiting after dinner is usually best, though not always true. You don't want to interrupt somebody's family dinner time. When you arrive, introduce yourself and ask if it's a good time to visit. Do not have men visiting women or women visiting men. So if you have uh, ministered to somebody and you're a woman and it was a man, bring a man with you. You should always, that should be a rule of thumb. You want to avoid the appearances of evil at all times. Um, be neat in appearance and polite. We kind of talked about this before. Um, you know, I had some questions come to me, like some people were thinking, well, what happens if I come from work and 
I might be, you know, a kind of smelly. Put deodorant in your car. Put some put some breast mints. Have some gum. Brush your hair in the car. Have some of those things on backup if that's in a situation. If you're wearing natural deodorant, you should be reapplying it anyway. So those are just some normal things um, to do. Um, be normal and at ease in conversation. Don't use Christianese all the time. Ask if they have questions about the church, the decision they've made, or about the Lord. You know, sometimes you can ask them to dinner. Invite them to your house if it's a... If it's someone you know, you know, obviously you'd have to use your discretion if you <laughs> saw somebody on the street. I don't typically invite them into my house. Um, use your discretion. But, you know, a lot of times these days it's very strange for people to do that. And they might you might be pleasantly surprised at how people respond to that or just. And, and, and the, this is just advice, you know, good practical wisdom advice here on these points, you know. Yes. Another situation that should be mentioned that has to do with follow-up for a person you have spoken to about the Lord outside of a church setting. Perhaps you've been able to pray with them, or maybe you simply planted some seeds. In either case, it's good to be able to leave something in their hands after departing. So we talked about like Jen's bookmark. Um, there's always little pocketbooks. Like I bought some pocketbooks at Identity that are fantastic. Those are all good resources you can leave with people. An easy-to-read Bible, um, a church invitation, something that has our, you know, EC and Sarah have cards that, and they just got some more in um, either today or tomorrow yeah, yeah. Um, that you can pass out. But the last and uh, final thing for this chapter is reaching the fullness of Christ. Going back to the text in Ephesians 4.13, the word stature speaks of development, growth, or level of attainment. What is the de desired level of attainment for the body of Christ? That's the fullness of Christ, full-grown Christians. Now, we, you know, we receive the fullness of him. We receive him when we become believers but we want to come all come to that unity of the faith and we want others to come to that fullness. The growth is both individual and corporate. There's a saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The ability to function with the corporate body is directly related to the ability to function individually. I recently heard a statement that seems fit here. When we are born, we need others to live. When we are dying, we need others to live. The key is we need others in between even more. Amen. This is especially true in both becoming and making disciples completely sold out for Jesus Christ. Bottom line is we need each other. Even at this stage, um, you know, you can still be mentoring somebody who's been a believer for 30 years. They could be believing the wrong thing. We discover that, believe it or not, more times than you think. People, we, sh we should always have the mindset, and, I, and I've talked about this before. I should never come to church, well, I've always, bless God, I've heard that already. I'm just going to scroll my Facebook page. We should always come with, God, what can I learn today? What can you show me? What truth can I learn today? And have an open heart to receive. If we're there, then we're going to also be that way with other people in giving out. Amen? Praise God. Before we move into chapter 10, I just wanted to say as a humorous thing, but it has happened. I've been to, listen, I have been to so many churches and I've heard the craziest of stories uh, when it comes to evangelism and some of those practical steps. And one of those things is, you know, we don't suggest that's part of our protocol. Protocol is, you know, um, in other words, having a standard of godliness. Um, so men, uh, you know, I'm not consulting with women um, or a man, a man's not consulting with another woman. A woman's not consulting with another man. They're not going into each other's homes, you know. Um, and I've been around some of the younger guys in, in churches over the life, over my life where they've had friendship evangelism. And uh, they friendship evangelized all the pretty girls of the church and uh, tried to go and make <laughs> disciples of them and visit privately with them, if you know what I mean, wink, wink, wink nudge, nudge. So that's not the kind of uh, friendship evangelism that we're talking about or mentorship programs by the laying on of hands. Glory to well, God. Well, a Amen. good example, so, we, we, um, you, you ministered with to that lady in groups at the outreach, not this past time, but the time before, and he and I are going to go to her house to pray for her. So he's not going to come back and pray for that lady by himself. I'm going to go with him. And so it's always kind of just, it's just going to save you a lot of trouble. It's going to avoid the appearance of evil. Um, and more than not, it's just going to save you a whole lot of trouble. All right.